New chip, old body, more expensive. Is the new iPhone SE worth it? And more importantly, what are the alternatives? Hello and welcome back to Marcos Reviews and thank you for subscribing if you have and if you haven't subscribed, the button is just down there. This is the new 2022 iPhone SE. Looks familiar, doesn't it? But it still remains the cheapest way to get into iOS. And now it's got the exact same chip as the iPhone 13 and even the iPhone 13 Pro and Pro Max. But can Apple really get away with this same tired old design in 2022? Before we get started, a very quick shout out to my friends at Reboxed who provided some of the review units and some of the Android competitors that you're gonna see later in this video. Reboxed is one of the best places online to sell, swap or shop premium Reboxed refurbished tech. You'll find much better prices for devices on that website, you'll save money, you'll save time, and you'll even save the planet while you're shopping with them. And that's because Reboxed are fighting the 50 million tons of e-waste we dump each year. They even plant five trees for every single device they rehome. And the devices are up to 40% cheaper than new. So to find out more about Reboxed, click the link in my description, and to save yourself £15 on orders over £200, just use the code MarkEllis15 at checkout. Right, let's have a look at the specs and pricing for this new iPhone SE. So in the UK, it's £419, which is more expensive than the 2020 version, which was £399. It's got the A15 Bionic chip, a 4.7 inch Retina HD display that is 720p with P3 color and true tone. There's a physical touch ID button. It's got IP67 water and dust resistance, a 12 megapixel rear camera with an F1.8 aperture, 5G support, and it comes in 64 gig, 128 gig and a 256 gig version of storage. And you can get the new SE in product red like this one, Starlight or Midnight. If we start with the design on the 2022 version of the iPhone SE, there is no doubting that this phone looks pretty dated. It's got massive bezels by today's standards at the top and bottom of the screen. And there's a physical home button. The physical touch ID button is still there. And because this doesn't have that kind of full screen display we're used to with the iPhone 13 series, you don't get the swipe up gestures that we're used to. In fact, if you swipe up from the bottom of the screen, you get control center, which does throw you at first. There's just one camera on the back, it charges via lightning. I know all iPhones charge via lightning, but it doesn't really help its cause. And there's not much more to say about it than that, really, in terms of design. It is typically Apple well-made, so there's no flex in it at all. It feels very solid, very well put together. It's got rear glass, which is quite nice. But that's kind of it. It's, a, it's an old fashioned looking iPhone. I genuinely can't think what else to say about the design. I quite like the product red. I like the fact that there's no writing on the back apart from the product red logo at the bottom and obviously the Apple logo. It's very clean design in that respect. I can't get any more excited about it really. When it comes to the performance, as I mentioned at the start of the video, this comes now with the A15 Bionic chip. And this is good news because it means it's basically as powerful as an iPhone 13 Pro Max, which costs about 1100 quid versus the 400 pounds or 419 pounds of this. So it's packing an awful lot of power. In fact, the only noticeable difference on the spec sheet for this is that it has one less GPU core than the iPhone 13 Pro and 13 Pro Max. They have five, this has four. In most cases, you're probably not gonna notice that. And this is where the iPhone SE has always scored quite highly. They put the latest chip in it and they just keep this kind of old fashioned dated body going. But that lets them get it down to a price that makes it the cheapest entry point into iOS. So you're kind of getting, you know, champagne power for lemonade money. And in terms of performance, it feels like a very fast iPhone, but then all iPhones feel quick. If you compare iPhones to a lot of Android phones, which are sometimes underpowered because of certain chip configurations and things, iPhones always feel buttery smooth in comparison. So it is just a very quick iPhone, as you would expect. It will play the latest games, no problem at all. It will feel very fluid in iOS. It won't have any problems with the camera system. You know, you can take photos very quickly. There's no lag or anything like that. It's also 5G compatible now. That was another big selling point as far as Apple is concerned. It isn't as far as I'm concerned. I think 5G still has a long way to go before it's ubiquitous. But, you know, it's nice that it's available now in here for people that can actually get 5G. As for the screen, it's okay. It's 720p, it's retina, it's not OLED, so you don't get the kind of deep blacks that you get from the other iPhones, the iPhone 13s, etc. of the world. But it's, it's just all right. It does the job, really. It also doesn't have ProMotion, which is Apple's high refresh rate screen technology. That's no surprise, really, when you consider that the regular iPhone iPhone 13 and 13 mini don't have it either, but that does cause a bit of an issue against the competition, which I'll come to later. 
As for the camera, it's all right, actually. It's a fairly solid performer, as you would expect from an iPhone. There's only one lens, but it does have some of the smart features like smart HDR, deep fusion. It doesn't have the night mode, which is a bit of a shame. I'll, I'll let them off that, but it's just a, a good iPhone camera. I do love the camera in my iPhone 13 mini. I have recently really got into the Samsung cameras. The S22 Ultra, for example, is a very good camera, but it's also a much more expensive phone than this one, so it's not really fair to compare it against that. But compared against the iPhone 13 mini, which is a couple of hundred quid more, roughly, it's, it stacks up pretty well, to be honest. It's a great video shooter. It's definitely worth mentioning that. I still think that iPhones are the kings of 4K video when it comes to smartphones. So you get a lot of the benefits of the more expensive iPhones in this small package. So the camera, it gets you by. Battery life. Now the iPhone SE from 2020 wasn't very highly regarded when it came to battery life. In fact, I know people that owned that phone and they thought it was terrible. Now this phone I charged last night and took it off the charge this morning at about 5.30 I think in the morning. It is now, where are we? The time is 20 past seven in the evening and I've still got 30% battery left, which I think is pretty good. In fact, it's very reminiscent of the iPhone 13 mini, which gives you all day battery life in my experience. So again, I never do detailed battery testing on this channel. You need to go elsewhere to look for that. But in terms of real world use, I've been using this over the last three or four days and it's been absolutely fine. It gets me through the day, no problem whatsoever. It is a shame that there's no MagSafe on the iPhone SE though. So the iPhone 13 mini, and obviously all the other iPhone 13s and the iPhone 12 before it, have magnets built into the back of the phone to which you can attach chargers and lots of accessories. This doesn't have it, and it's, um, yeah, I miss it actually. I think the ability to charge via MagSafe is fantastic. I don't think we're asking much for Apple to put the MagSafe technology into the iPhone SE. So who is this iPhone SE for? This is a tough one, I think, because back in 2020, this design, even back then, I thought was pushing it a little bit. Because when you compared it to some of the competition, which we'll look at in a moment, most of the Android competitors at that price point or below were offering full screen designs, no buttons on the front, facial recognition, and all sorts of things that the iPhone SE 2020 wasn't doing. Now we fast forward two years and it's pretty much the same deal. But Apple is very shrewd like this as a business. They know that people will buy this phone and they know that they can get as much profitability out of this chassis as possible. But really the only people I can recommend this for is for anyone who wants the absolute base price for a new iPhone to get into the iOS ecosystem. If that's what you want, you have no choice but to get the iPhone SE. Equally, if you don't like the idea of Face ID and you want Touch ID, you have no choice but to go with the iPhone SE. For that audience, it will work absolutely perfectly. They'll see it as very good value for money, and it also has a lot of horsepower under the hood to boot. But for everyone else, I think there are some better alternatives. We'll start, ironically, with the iPhone SE from 2020. And the reason for that is, firstly, if you buy it from Rebox, you can get it for £239, which is a bit of a bargain. But also because it's not that different to this year's version. Yet this has the A13 Bionic versus the A15 Bionic in the new one. But it's still a quick phone. iPhones are so well built and the chips are so fast that they last for many, many years. It's still the same size as the new version. It's got the same storage options. It runs the latest version of iOS. It's IP67 water and dust resistant. It's basically the same phone with a different chip in it. So the iPhone SE second generation from 2020 is still worth a look. Next up, we have the Samsung A53 5G, which I don't have yet. It's a brand new phone. It's just been announced and it looks really interesting. Clearly, Samsung are pitching the A53 squarely at the iPhone SE. It costs £399, so it's cheaper. It's got a 6.5-inch AMOLED display, which is 120 hertz, so it does have that high refresh rate. It's got a hole-punch camera, it's got facial recognition, it's even got a micro SD card slot, it's got a quad camera system with a 64 megapixel sensor, and it's even got a 5,000 milliamp hour battery, which is the exact same battery in the S22 Ultra, which gets you two days of battery life. So like I say, I don't have an A53 at the moment, I'm gonna try and get one in for a review, but if you want to see someone's opinion on it, check out the tech chap who I will link to in the video description. Now, if you wanna spend less than 400 pounds, I would recommend again looking at Samsung and their A21S. Now you can pick this up for about 170 to 180 pounds, and it's a pretty nice phone. It does feel a bit more plasticky than the iPhone SE because it is, but it does have a 
well, a pretty big screen, 6.5 inches, 720p, we'll forgive them that, but it's got very small bezels, edge to edge design, it's got that hole punch camera at the top, it's got a rear fingerprint sensor, facial recognition, got five cameras, you can get it in 32 gigabytes to 128 gigabytes, but also it has a micro SD card slot as well. It's got a 5,000 milliamp hour battery, which again should get you close to two days worth of battery life. There's no IP rating, so it isn't technically dust and water resistant, which is a bit of a shame. But apart from that, this is quite a performer. It's a pretty quick phone as well. It's not as fast as an iPhone SE, but it will get you by. And for the money, it's nearly half the price of the iPhone SE. For that lovely big screen, the pretty good camera system, I think the A21s is a pretty good buy. Next up, we have the OnePlus Nord 2 5G. Now you can pick this up for about £370, it's 5G ready, it's got 8 gigabytes or 16 gigabytes of RAM, it's got a 6.4 inch AMOLED display which is P3 colour as well and it also has a 90 hertz refresh rate. It's got three lenses, standard, ultra wide and a monochrome lens, it can also do night photography and the battery can go on for about 22 hours. And the other thing with the OnePlus Nord is that it's really well built, it feels almost iPhone like, not quite, but for the money you're getting really good build quality and in fact out of all of the iPhone SE competitors in front of me, this is the nicest looking I think and probably the best built. Next up we have one of my favourite phones from the last couple of years which is the Google Pixel 4a. Now you can pick these up these days for about £350-360 pounds, and that is a lot of phone for the money. So firstly you get a pure Android experience which is what you would expect from Google's own phone and also in my opinion you're getting one of the best smartphone cameras on the market. I'll leave a link above to my original review of the Pixel 4a because I go into a bit more detail in that review about the camera performance. I just love it. The screen is a bit smaller than some of the competition here, but it's OLED, it's 5.8 inches. For me, it's just a, it's a lovely size. It is plasticky, it's got no IP rating, so there's a few downsides there, but given the price, this is such a good little phone. Lastly, we have the Moto G50. Now you can get this for about 200 pounds. It's 5G, it's got a 6.5 inch display. It's got the Snapdragon 480, which is nothing special, but works pretty well. It's also got a 5,000 milliamp hour battery Battery, so it's another strong performer in that regard. It's got that rear fingerprint sensor here, but also facial recognition. Again, no IP rating and it's a bit plasticky. Feels quite solid actually, but it's, it's definitely a few notches down in terms of build quality compared to the iPhone SE. But again, the price, it's about half the price and it's, it's a great phone. Even just the screen of that battery life alone, it gets by quite nicely. If you've got a bit more time and also you don't mind spending a bit more on your iPhone than the iPhone SE, you know, for example, if these Android phones just aren't cutting it for you, then you can do a lot worse than go for the iPhone 13 mini. So if your budget can stretch to this phone, keep watching for a link to my full review. But until next time, thank you as always for watching and I'll catch you next time.